thank you guys and, uh, for braving the, uh, the beautiful weather <laughs> to, uh, to make it out here tonight. Um, and thank you, Delia, for, and Ben for inviting us and setting us all, uh, this whole event up. It is always great to be in Boston. I went to school here. Um, many fond memories. Of, well, not here. Well, not here, no. <laughs> but I still have fond memories of what we said. And, uh, and it's great to be with you guys, and we're really looking forward to, uh, you know, not just sharing our story, but getting some of your stories, uh, literally, figuratively, um, out in front of, of us. And, um, you know, just begin by introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm, I'm actually Mike. I'm not sure if these guys can use microphones, because I have some sort of horribly virulent, not quite swine flu, but like the next best thing thing. So I know this. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to raise my voice too much, but I'm Jeff Yang. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Secret Identities, and uh, I guess I'll let uh, my colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Keith Chow, the Editor-at-Large of Secret Identities. And I'm uh, Jerry Ma, the uh, Art Director. And uh, we have a, a fourth musketeer, as, as Keith likes to say, Perry Shen, who is not with us today because he's on the West Coast. It was a long trip, um, and it was cold here. <laughs> but uh, he, he gives his best, uh, and otherwise he would be here. And you know, we'll, we'll actually have him kind of in spirit because uh, what we'd like to do when we start this thing out is we have a little documentary that actually Parry himself kind of cobbled together um, that kind of tells a little bit of the, the backdrop as to uh, where Secret Identities came from, why we did it, and uh, what it's all about. Um, so let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's start with that. Um, so if we get some lights, uh, we will um, we'll put this on, and, and after that, we will. What is secret identities? What is secret identities? What is secret identities? I and I think a lot of other people grew up. Uh, in a world, to a certain extent, without heroes, you know, at least not Asian American heroes. And the place we turn, that I turn, certainly, to, uh, to look for, I don't know, maybe not inspiration per se, but a sense of the possible, you know, was comic books. I mean, they were all about people who were, you know, greater than human, but with greater than human responsibility, you know, who hid their powers behind masks, who were in their real lives, normal and unnoticed, but in their superhero identities, their, their other lives, you know, were extraordinary. And that's something which I think most guys, most kids in general growing up, want to think about themselves. I think Asian Americans more so, because we are culturally seen as that sort of silent group, that group that is too easily ignored. And so looking at, at our issues through the lens of the superhero just seemed like it made sense. I think that's the one thing that's really been uh, missing in the industry. We have Asian Americans behind the scenes and we have Asian Americans buying it, but we never really see Asian American characters. And I think having that, putting us in front of the camera, as it were, is an important thing. Basically, we got together some of the top Asian American comic artists in the business and paired them with uh, Asian American writers, directors uh, from the literary, film, and television world. And what was born was uh, 26 original stories with uh, Asian American superheroes and protagonists at the forefront. The editors really did take on a much larger role, and there's a universe that is being put together here. It's not just stories by some artists and writers thrown to slap onto a page with a specific message to be said. And that message I would like to think is that we, we as Asian Americans, need to be the hero every once in a while. We have stories at length by theme by topic, by subject. Two of the things we're doing in the book. One is taking history as it actually occurred and layering this other filter over it, you know, the sort of shadow history we're calling it, in which we use the lens of superheroes to illuminate issues, real issues, that sometimes get overlooked when you just talk about them in sort of normal historical terms. And the second thing, of course, is that we are taking the experience of, of Asian Americans, you know, where we, we're people with a lot of masks, you know, um, a lot of identities that are both uh, external facing and internal facing and, and you know, with a gap between the two and, and sort of using the, the metaphor of the superhero to really explore that part of our style. So. All right, no more talking heads. Let's show you guys exactly what's on the 200 pages sandwiched in between this glossy green piece of cardstock. My name is Professor Shen and this is SI Anatomy 101. Cue music, here we go. 
We have actor Dustin Wynn and artist Dustin Wynn, who currently draws Batman for DC Comics, come up with a character called Agent Orange. From actress Keiko Gana from Gilmore Girls and artist Ming Doyle, we have a story called Learn to Share about an eight-year-old girl who's blind but can borrow the sight of people nearby her. Superstar Marvel writer Greg Pak and Wonder Woman artist Bernard Chang give us The Citizen. Then from actress Lin Chen from Saving Face and Paul Wei, we've got You Are What You Eat about a bulimic teen who receives a mystical belt from her grandmother. Writer Jean Yang wrote and created the book American Born Chinese, which was the only graphic novel ever to be nominated for a National Book Award. He teams up with artist Sunny Liu of Liquid City to give us the blue scorpion and chung. These guys explore the whole Green Hornet and Kato psychic dynamic in their story. Also exploring the psychic dynamic is a story called James from director Michael Kang from West 32nd and The Motel with uh, Erwin Hyatt in the art. Author Jamie Ford of Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, currently in bookstores, teams up with Alexander Tarampi to give us a on. The story centers around a teenager slowly learning about his powers of invincibility. Actress Kelly Hu of X-Men 2 and The Scorpion King teams up with rock star comic artist Cliff Chang to give us Gia. Kaz Kabushi, creator of the Flight Anthology series, was gracious enough to create a character named Go for us. Greg LaRoque is someone that all of us editors grew up reading. He used to draw Flash, amongst many other things, and he created a character named Trinity for us. Survivor Cook Island winner Yul Kwan teams up with Diodato to create Cataclysm. Sorry, Yul, for using this photo of you, but you are one of the few people who actually have a superhero physique and your life in this anthology, so you need to show that off. Then we've got actor Leonardo Nam from He's Just Not That Into You. He was the one in all the ad that would say, I heard that MySpace is the new beauty call. Teams up with Anthony Tan to give us shine. Then we've got my... Something happened. <laughs> All right, well, you know, I'm thinking that maybe we have, uh, we have hit some sort of technological thing here. But you know, that gives you kind of a backdrop of what the book is about. Uh, there's more, much, much more, and we'll hope you actually take a look at it in uh, the book itself. Um, but uh, our PowerPoint quit. Um, so uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll reopen this. But in the meantime, um, just to give you a context for you know what we were uh, trying to accomplish with that video, um, you know, a lot of questions get asked us, and, and probably the first one is, you know, why did you do the book? Why a book about comic books? You know, I mean, comic books. What's so important about about comics that you know uh, make it relevant or, or critical for Asian Americans in particular to be part of that? And um, you know, the uh, the rest of the PowerPoint presentation, which hopefully will not crash, <laughs> um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, Keith. Uh, why don't we uh, talk a little bit more about uh, about the book and its origin? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we each come to you know this comic from our different angles. Uh, Jeff is you know a journalist that he, he writes for the Chron uh, the San Francisco Chronicle. I used to work for a company called Diamond Comics Distributors, which is the, basically all the comic books that you see are distributed through them. And and Jerry, who uh, has his own design studio called Epic Proportions, where you can find these fine T-shirts at EpicProps.com. Uh, he also used to do comics, uh, indie comics, uh, couple, you know, back in the day. So we all have our own, and even Perry, who is best known as the lead actor for Better Luck Tomorrow, started his career as an intern at Marvel. So, you know, we all have a comics background uh, in one way or the other, and, and we're all fans. So what we noticed um, growing up reading comics and, and enjoying comics is that, some, and you can, you can tell by, the, uh, by the, the, the slides that did show, a lot of the artists and creators of comics are Asian American. Uh, when you saw Cliff Chang, you saw Dustin Nguyen, Jim Lee is probably the, the biggest name in comics, and they're all Asian American. Larry Hama, for example, created all the mythology behind G.I. Joe. And when I was a kid, I had no idea he was Japanese American. So like, you know, the real American hero was created by this Japanese American war veteran. Um, so all, all these things came into play, but what we noticed is that even though there were a lot of Asian Americans behind the scenes, you didn't see any Asian American characters on the pages, because you know, quick show of hands. Uh, well, not show of hands, but who can name like their five favorite Asian American superheroes? Anyone? Crickets chirp. <laughs> right. So that that's that's kind of where we came from. Uh, you know, the origin. And so we decided to do comics, uh, for one, being fanboys, but also because, you know, you know, when you look at comic books, I mean, 
I'm just, everyone is familiar with the characters that you see on, on the screen right now, right? I mean, who doesn't know who Batman is, and Superman, is, and Spider-Man, and, and the X-Men? Um, you know, these, these characters are woven into the fabric of what it, what it means to be American, you know? They, they, they were born in what's called the Golden Age, back in the 30s, you know? And, and they're, 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 they're part of our popular culture. It doesn't matter, you know, if you read comics or not, you know who Superman is. It doesn't mean, matter, you know, whether or not you've, you've gone, go to the comic shop every week, you know who Superman is and Batman and all these guys. So what we decided to do with comics is that we wanted to take what transcends popular culture and, and put a distinctly Asian American face on it. And, you know, I mean, part of the reason why it's so critical to have that Asian American face on it is, you know, when you talk about these as being American icons, as being essentially the equivalent of our 20th and 21st century contemporary mythology, you know, like the Greek myths, you know? Uh, they inform literature, they inform the entire scope of culture, you know, coming out uh, not just through the golden age of Greece and then Rome, but through the Renaissance and through the, Refor you know, through all the way up, in, uh, you know, into uh, effectively contemporary literary times. And, you know, what we're seeing is that the value of comics, the role of comics in our society today is equivalent. The icons, you know, that people look to, the stories people remember, the origins that people can actually summon up at the tip of their tongues. You know, everybody knows, you know, that Superman came from Kry Krypton. He was shot in a rocket. You know, he was adopted, transracially adopted by a, a Kansas couple and, and raised to follow truth, justice, the American way. That is like gospel. And in fact, I think um, there was a survey which showed that uh, more people could actually tell the origin story of Superman than could tell the story of baby Jesus, <laughs> which is maybe troubling, but at the same time kind of gives a, a rendering of the priority at some level. We should like totally that. have a Superman holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Super um, Christmas. Well, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting too because um, you may ask yourselves, and you know, if, if our goal was, you know, proper authentic representation in media, this, you know, your question again might go back to then why comic books? I mean, if, if um, we want you know better representation of Asian Americans in movies and films and television. Movies and film, that's the same thing. Um, why why do we do comic books? You know, we could have done anything. Perry's an actor, you know, you're a writer. So why why did we do comic books? Well, the other thing about comics, and you know, we've already mentioned that everyone knows who Superman is, everyone knows who Batman is. But it's also the foundation from which all these other forms of media come about. Um, you know, we were at San Diego Comic Con back in July, and it's the biggest comic book convention in America. And and Part of the reason why it's so big is that Hollywood producers, you know, San Diego so close to Los Angeles, they come to and you know they come to the everyone's booth and they see you have a book. They say, you know, are there stories in this book? I'm like, they come with like a garbage bag. Literally. Yeah, and they're, they're literally just like, all right, I'll buy it, and they stick it in a bag, and they because you know they're doing research and development because you know comic books are essentially storyboards, right? So this is this is what what we were thinking is this is where other forms of media come from, and just looking at you know some something like Batman starts out as a comic book, but it becomes action figures. It becomes DVDs and TV series. It becomes video games. It becomes movies that gross $2 billion, right? You know, and uh, part of what uh, is remarkable about that is, you know, when you think about how locked out Asian Americans have been in these other places in culture, in, in cinema, in television, you know, in, in these sort of big arcs of popular culture, it's like comics are a loophole or something. The law says no Asians, right? But if you actually can, can create characters that are vivid and real and you know, representative in the comic book form because comics are essentially movies, comics are storyboards. You know, one of our, our uh, you know, frequent collaborators uh, and a top artist, uh, top writer himself, uh, Greg Pak, um, said that the reason why he went from indie filmmaking over to comics, he started out as an indie filmmaker, uh, is because he could actually do with comic books a $200 million movie full of you know, kind of flamboyant special effects uh, as big as his imagination, for a buck fifty, you know the the only boundaries are the size of the printed page, and you know you, you can't do that in any other medium and still have the opportunity to take that story and potentially translate it into something bigger. The the other aspect of uh, comic books too is that if you look at the history of comics from from back in the 30s when when, when they started at least here in America through today, uh, the representation of Asians and Asian Americans hasn't been so great. <laughs> Uh, on the screen right now is Detective Comics number one. Detective Comics is one of the longest running comic book in the history of the United States. It's also the, the, the comic that stars Batman. This is where Batman came from. And this iconic issue, Detective Comics number one, has this on the cover. When you go into a comic book museum, and they exist, 
this is what you see. You see this guy, his name's like Chung Lung or something stupid like that. Oh. <laughs> um, and then it doesn't get better. I mean, Wonder Woman's, this is an actual Wonder Woman villain. His name is Egg Fu. He's a giant yellow egg. You know, you, you gotta think there's some sort of like metaphorical thing in there. <laughs> but, I'd like to know what it is. Yeah, his, his, his uh, art villain partner is a giant banana. Or something. Right. <laughs> Uh, it, it doesn't give, I mean, Iron Man, you know, it, in fact, there's a rumor that the Mandarin, which is the Iron Man's arch-villain, might be in the next movie. You know, it's it just throughout the years, if we're not the bad guys, we're the, we're the kung fu guy who doesn't wear shoes, right? So there's, it's, it hasn't been really uh, positive. So that's the other reason we went with, with, Asian, uh, with comic books, because, like, the only Asians in comics are either the bad guys, the martial arts experts, or the sexy, you know, uh, dominatrix who, who uses her sex appeal to, to entice people and for some reason comic book artists have an obsession with the Japanese battle flag. I don't know what it is, but like if you're a Jap if you're an Asian superhero, you have to have a Japanese battle flag on your person somewhere. Uh, as 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 evidenced by these sports. <laughs> but it's not all necessarily bad. There are there are Asian American superheroes and Asian American comic book characters, especially in the last few years that have that have kind of broken through the mold and, and not lived up to the stereotypes. Guys like uh, Am Amadeus Cho, who Greg Pak created, or didn't create, but he created, uh, he created Cho, but he didn't create the character that he played, this guy named Mastermind Excello. Uh, and other people, Dr. Light, the Atom was, was rechristened as an Asian American a couple years ago. Uh, the, the detective on the right is a guy named uh, Richard Chu, who was actually created by a Caucasian artist, but um, he, he made it a, a point that if, he, if they ever made a film version of his comic book, which is about this detective who has the ability to see the lives of everything he eats, so like if he eats a hamburger, he actually sees in his head the cow being slaughtered. That's why his last name's Chew. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what's interesting too is that he's a homicide detective, so you can put the pieces together to see how he solves his crimes. Um, but he based the, uh, the character on a guy named Ken Lung. If you've ever seen the show Lost, Ken Lung plays Miles Strom, the, uh, the psychic who can talk to the dead. That actor, he's also been in Rush Hour. He's, he's, he's a really popular actor. He's been in like, um, Several other movies. He, uh, he, he was in uh, X Men Two as the yeah. Guy he was he was the guy with the needle in his face. face. So he made it. He made a point. He said, if they ever make a film, I need Ken Lung to play it, which is actually not the uh, the standard, I would say, when it comes to and comic we'll about that movie well. adaptations of comics. So, so I mean, I'm not trying to paint that like comics are a completely you know out of touch racist industry. In fact, Larry Hama, who I mentioned earlier, has said that comics are the least racist industry because it's, it really is merit based. If you're a good artist. You, you'll get a job. You live and die based on what you do. And you know, the thing is, I mean, he actually explicitly said, you know, people in, co in comics do not see color. I mean, the only color they might, you know, you, you could be black, brown, red, yellow, white, you know, or green, for the, and, you know, and they, they're equally comfortable with alien races as with, you know, different human races. So, you know, the, the real issue is whether or not you actually can create the other kind of green. If, you, <laughs> if you're successful, if you can make money, you can succeed. That's true in any industry, but in comics especially, you know, you're tracked by how many copies you sell, period. So. And, and, and the thing, and so what we, what we wanted to do with Secret Identities is have uh, this resource where if, say, a Hollywood executive wanted to come by and do a, a movie or film based on the stories in our book, he would have to, uh, he or she would have to make sure that the, the, the adaptation represents the Asian Americanness of, of the stories in our book. Because what we've seen um, in, this, in recent history, too, is that it's not always the case that if your character is Asian or Asian-ish, <laughs> that when they make the movie version of it, that they'll, they'll remain true to that. And, and Jerry's had experience with that, where, where you, he, like I said, he used to do a comic, and he actually had a, a, a talks, negotiations for a movie, but what was the, uh, what was the ultimatum you were given? For, for, explain what your comic was first, and then tell us what the ultimatum from Hollywood was. Well, uh, I used to do this comic with my brothers uh, called Burn, and it's, uh, it's a Chinatown gangster story, so we base it a lot off of Hong Kong films and there's a lot of like tragic love stuff going on. And just lots of, uh, it's very urban, but it's, I mean, extremely Asian. And um, we were being approached by like, I, I'm, like literally like maybe like 10, 10 to 15 like uh, studio houses just calling. They, I don't even know how they got my phone number. Like they were literally, I was just hanging out with my friends and they'd call me on a weekend on my cell phone and just be like, hey, aren't you the guy that does burn, you know? Done a lot of bathroom walls. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so like we actually uh, we, we flew out to San Diego uh, for the first time just for a few meetings with a whole bunch of these agents and everything and uh, a lot of guys are extremely interested they like it's really sellable we can definitely make a movie out of this they were already telling me how uh, 
BMW. They were all going to drive BMW motorcycles and <laughs> BMW cars and drink, you know, Seven Up soda and you know, and Heineken beer. Like that's all they were going to do. And it's going to be a huge marketing thing, yeah. But the, the only catch though for me was that they were like, you know, I, I gave them a list of directors and actors and actresses that I thought would, would be good for it. And they were like, the, all the women are beautiful. We, we love them. You know? The guy, he, he looks so cool, the bad guy. But the one thing is, uh, you know, the hero, can he be white? You know? And I was just like, well, you know, it's a, a Chinatown gangster story. Right? <laughs> and, I was, and he's like, yeah, yeah, but, you know, can he be white? You know, the girlfriend <laughs> can be Asian. The bad guy can be Asian, you know? But the hero, he's like, come on, man. Like, you know, we got to sell this thing. You know? Like, you know better than this. Like, come on, let's make him white, you know? And uh, I was just like, all right, man, I'll talk to you later. Well, let me, let me think about it, yeah. And then the more I actually sat on it, and uh, they, they, like, I guess it got hotter because I wasn't saying anything. Um, that's when I got started. I, I was being approached by some bigger name guys, um, which they're always trying to get me to say. Because <laughs> um, there was one in particular that was extremely close. Like, it was, it was basically a done deal. All I had to do was say yes. Like, the contracts were written up. Uh, everything was ready to go. And this guy, like, I really like his work. And he's got dark hair. He's got dark hair. He kind of <laughs> looks Asian, you know? He's got a, he's got a one-syllable last name. <laughs> um, you know, like, I was hanging out with him. We, we were getting some drinks. And, like, I was like, this guy is so cool. Like, like, maybe we can do it, you know? And I remember, like, I lost so much sleep because I was just thinking to myself, like, I, I was talking with my dad and my mom. I'm like, do I do it? Do I do it? Do I sell out? You know? <laughs> and then they, they were just like, you know, you're not broke. You have a job. If they don't, you know, if they like it now, they'll like it ten years from now. Yeah, mm -hmm. like don't don't give it to uh, the first guy. So then, uh, ten years later, he's like, what? I know. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, so I actually said no, and uh, and and that guy went on to make all these other films with like pirates and stuff in it. So. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, I mean, the, but the, the guy, I mean, you know, obviously, it's it's not even a matter of whether or not you respect the actor or not. It, there's an integrity, you know, obviously, and an, an integrity to the stuff that you know that. Jerry was doing, and you know the stuff that we want to see done as well. Um, you know, and it, it's it's not even like just fictional stuff. I mean, even you know actual nonfiction biographies kind of get that treatment. You know, the, the two actually that uh, that Keith wanted to pull out here, uh, just as far as you know, looking at source material versus the, the you know ultimate reality. Um, you may or may not recognize these. It depends how much you're kind of into. Is, is anyone in here familiar comments. with Dragon Ball, any at all? Yeah, it looks like a good turnout. Here. Yeah, I mean, dra I mean, if you look, at Dragon Ball is a Japanese anime. It's actually kind of loosely based on the Monkey King, which is a Chinese legend. Um, you know, I would guess, and it's probably the most popular comic in the world. I would think one of one of. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's got like millions and millions of readers and followers. Um, and uh, growing up, I always assumed Goku, this guy, was Asian. I mean, <laughs> look at him. <laughs> He's got the hair and everything. So you know. When, I don't know if you knew or not, but they made a movie last year called Dragon Ball Evolution. And, um, and, and they cast, uh, it had Chow Yun Fat and Jamie Chung and all these Asian actors in it, but Goku was uh, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> not Asian. Uh, he's got hair doesn't look right. Yeah, he's, 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 he doesn't have the same it's like texture. I don't know what it is. Well, so uh, the, the point though was that we, we can't cast, we, we can't make Goku an Asian because like, like what Jerry and Jeff were alluding to, that's not going to sell. People aren't going to go see a movie with an Asian lead, even though the movie's based on like an Asian source and the characters are Asian and the legend is Asian and everything's Asian. People will go see that, but people are going to be very uncomfortable seeing an Asian actor portray all that, which is kind of, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And in fact, if I were not an Asian person, I would probably find that very offensive to say that I can only identify with, you know, I can I, I as a Caucasian cannot identify with white or with uh, Asian people. It's just inherently impossible. So therefore, I, mean, I must be catered to. I, nobody, I find that everyone wonders why Asian people cannot watch white people without kind of running in fear or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and so, it, but it hasn't stopped because there's another movie that's coming out next year called Avatar: The Last Airbender, and there's this whole organization called RaceBending.com that's that's where I got some of these pictures from. That their whole raison d'etre is that um, this movie adaptation should remain true to the source. Anyone here familiar with Avatar The Last Airbender? Again, um, it's, it's, a, it's a story that's got a lot of Asian influences, like a lot of martial arts influence, a lot of Asian philosophy. In fact, I mean, look at the title. It's got Asian freaking Chinese characters in the title. <laughs> so um, Hollywood made, they even cast, they, they got an Asian American director to do the movie. His name's M. Night Shyamalan, the guy who did Sixth Sense. 
So he, he, um, he, yeah. he has the movie. <laughs> and uh, again, the uh, three heroes are decidedly not Asian. Uh, one of the, one of the um, reasons, again, was that well, we wanted, we wanted people to identify with the characters, and we just wanted the best actors, even though like Aang is supposed to be this great martial artist. He's not even an actor. He's this kid who, who knows martial arts that they cast. Um, but you know, they, they, did, they did compromise. We'll cast one Asian. We'll get the guy from Slumdog Millionaire, and he'll be the bad guy. So we still haven't made a lot of uh, progress. Um, and and Jeff, Jeff alluded to also, it doesn't, it's not limited to just you know, fiction. Even stories that, that kind of, you know, this has got a Boston connection. It's, a, it's about a bunch of MIT students. This book called Bringing Down the House was about a bunch of MIT students who went to Las Vegas they, with the ability to count cards and swindled like the houses with millions and millions of dollars. Oh, you call it swindling. Well, I call yeah. it just, you know, taking natural advantage but, um, <laughs> of, their, yeah. of, their, of their innate abilities. Their innate Asian abilities. Because you know, the, the point actually about the book is that the reason why they were able to get a, away with this, uh, these MIT students, and come on, MIT, right? Made in Taiwan. Everybody's Asian there. You know? uh, but the reason why they were able to get away with it is because you know, they were throwing huge amounts of cash. I mean, just like clunking down you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in each hand. And the uh, pit bosses in, in casinos in, in Las Vegas saw that all the time. If you're Asian and you come in with a, a huge hunch of, you know, hunk of currency, even if you're really young, they kind of, it's not out of the ordinary. But you know, if like uh, a non-Asian kid were to come up with that much money and, and place you know, kind of regular bets, it would probably set off some sort of s suspicious warnings, right? So the idea that, you know, that uh, these kids were Asian to begin with was actually integral to the story. And when Ben Nesrick wrote this book, this best-selling book, Bringing Down the House, you know, it was based around you know, a specific set of, the specific group of people who are real human beings. You know? In fact, when, when the book came out, Perry, our, our fourth partner, uh, he had just come off of Better Luck Tomorrow. You know, every, everyone in that movie, including the director Justin Lin, was, was, was hot property at the time because when that movie came out, it was the number one movie per screen in the country. It even beat an Adam Sandler movie that weekend. So when this book came out, he, he called up Justin Lin, who's a director, and all, all his buddies, like, we got to buy the rights to this movie, right, buy the rights to this book. It's about these Asian kids, and, and it's, it's really, you know, dramatic and intriguing. We have to have the rights to this book so we can make a movie. And, and I think Justin called him right back and said, uh, it's kind of too late. Uh, a guy named Kevin Spacey already bought the rights to the book. And if you haven't heard of the book, you've probably heard of the movie. It's called 21. Anyone see this movie? Yeah, again, the lead character, Jim Sturgis, the lead actor, that's who they got to play that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, the guy on the left is, is uh, Jeff Ma. Like, uh, you know, Jared Love Child. <laughs> half Jeff, half Jared Ma. Uh, but Jeff Ma, uh, and you know, he, again, it was, he was the ringleader of this group. You know, it was his life story that was told by Ben Masaryk. Uh, and then you know, Hollywood decided that uh, you know, his, his virtual clone is Jim Sturgis, the guy right. And then, you know, there's an interesting quote that uh, someone had actually interviewed Jeff. I think it was like on anycool.com or something like that. They had interviewed Jeff and asked him, what did, what, what did it feel like to have you know, your life story be told and they cast you know, a person who's not Asian to play you in a movie? And he, his response was actually intriguing, I felt. Because he said, well, you know, it's actually kind of cool because when you, know, when you think of having a movie made about you, you don't necessarily think, this is what he's saying, I'm paraphrasing, you don't necessarily think yeah, who's the most ethnically like me? I want so you know I want someone cool. I didn't want someone like John Cho or Jackie Chan or Chai Yun Fat to play me. I wanted someone cool, cool. And that the that is more cool than Chai Yun Fat. Well, yeah, <laughs> but that's debatable. And what I find interesting about that that distinction that he made is one, you know, that there are no cool Asian actors. That if, if they were to cast an Asian actor, it would automatically be not cool. And two, that Chai Yun Fat and Jackie Chan are, are qualified or or eligible to even play Jeff Ma in a movie. So the, the, it's, the same, it's the same mentality that a lot of Hollywood executives have. First, they conflate Asian American and Asian, and you also assume that there are no young, cool Asian American actors, which, you know, none of these guys could have possibly played Jeff Ma, <laughs> right? I mean, none of these guys are cool, young Asian American actors. So, so it, of course they had to cast the only non-Asian guy who could play an Asian guy, right? Other than Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai, I guess. <laughs> And you know the whole the whole notion of, of we to tell my life story I don't need someone ethnically like me is fine. I mean I always thought that the guy who would play me in the Keith Chow story was Denzel Washington, but you know. <laughs> that is an uncanny resemblance. I, I think so. Um, but you know I mean so one of the other things about about this the journey of doing this book is that you know out of the four of us, uh, excepting Jerry, you know each of us had kids actually during the course of the of the 
<laughs> Jeremy had, had kids too. He, he doesn't know. Uh, but uh, you know, the three of us uh, became fathers. Perry and I for the second time, and, and Keith for the first time. And you know, the whole mentality that Jeff Ma even in that quote has this notion that you know you can't uh, associate being Asian with being cool. Kind of like almost instinctively, you think oh, I can't think of anybody cool who could portray my story that I'd want to see on screen. That's something that comes out of not having. Not having heroes, not having you know, kind of representations in your life that really you know, sort of pull together uh, a self-image, a sense of self-esteem that can sustain you even when you're you're, you're you know you're not in a position of uh, necessarily being made into a thirty million dollar you know uh, budget movie. And for us, you know, as as parents, as as fathers, you know, kind of transmitting uh, another kind of a world, you know, a vision of a world in which we really could have, you know. A Justice League that looked like us, like all of us, you know, uh, truly kind of diverse and, and truly uh, authentic to the kind of society we live in. That was something we thought was kind of important. And so, you know, this is sort of our, our, our you know, backdrop for why it is that we wanted to do this book in particular. Why comics? Why a comic? Why this comic? And then most importantly, you know, why this we felt was the best lever we could use for changing the media and how the media looks at us as Asian Americans. Because ultimately, it's about taking ownership of it. And, and you know, it's easy to, to sit back and, and complain. You know, like, you know, I, I've done my fair share of, of, of complaining when, when I see, like, stuff like what happened with 21 and what happened with, you know, Avatar and, you know. But it's another thing to, to do something actively, do something about it. And that's kind of what we put upon ourselves to do this particular book. We, wanted, we said we want to do our own book, tell our own stories, authentically Asian-American stories, so that if Hollywood comes by and says, I want to I want to take your, you know, story about Japanese internment, and and make a movie out of it. They can turn around and say, but I want Tom Cruise to play the guy who gets interned. I mean, they could. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they probably would. The last Nisei. Yeah. But 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 at least you know if, if all of our stories come from an authentic place, then maybe, you know, our stories are are actually being told. And and what we're going to try to do today is is get you guys well on that same page with us. Yeah, and we we have a little bit. I mean, of, of time I think before that. I just checked it out time. You know, one of the things that we, we, we want to kind of uh, contextualize is how this book came together. Because, you know, the exercise we want to do with you is something we've been doing for a while. It's, it's you know, we call it the Build a Hero Workshop. You know, we actually collaborate with the audience to create an original superhero that is then rendered by, by uh, you know, an artist. And in this case, we're lucky enough to have Jerry with us on the spot. Um, but, you know, in order to understand why that was an empowering experience and a challenging one, you know, we, we want to walk through a little bit of the creative process itself. And, you know, when we first decided to do this book, I mean, you know, it was a, almost like a whim. The three of us got together, we pulled in Perry, and the four of us were saying, you know, we know all these creators out there, all these people who are brilliant storytellers, but they don't tell stories about themselves, about Asian Americans. So, you know, let's open up the doors and see what people submit. Let's get the ideas that, that are flowing through people's minds when we say Asian American superhero. And the, the craziest thing is like, you know, for the first couple of months, all the story submissions we were getting were basically about heroes whose power was food. It was like, you know, we had Soy Sauce Man, you know, <laughs> Kiko Man, basically. Um, we had, you know, Fortune Cookie Monster. Fortune, oh, this, this, uh, this actually very prominent um, uh, academic, Asian American academic, we're not even going to go into details here, uh, who, who submitted something. He was a pr prominent literary figure as well. Submitted something that um, was a story uh, about. Um, about this pair of Asian kids who get kidnapped by this pedophile, you know, and taken to this sort of deserted fortune cookie factory. And the way that they actually defeat this villain is by pouring hot fortune cookie dough all over him, turning him into a fortune, you know, a human fortune cookie. And, you know, we're getting this stuff and reading and thinking, man, you know, we don't know what we want yet, but we're pretty sure it's not this. <laughs> Um, so we were, we were kind of like at a standstill. I mean, we, you know, we were looking for that theme, the, the thing that crystallized how the book was going to hang together. So it wasn't just, you know, sort of a, a jigsaw puzzle of different ideas that have sort of a, a vaguely Asian resonance to them. And that's when actually Jerry outreached to a friend of his who was writing stuff for Image Comics at the time, um, who came up with a story, a very short and simple one, uh, that he shared with us that kind of pulled it all together for us. Do you want to show the video? I'll get that ready. Well, Jerry, why don't you talk a little bit about it? Uh, well, basically, you know, uh, going to comic conventions and everything as an artist, when you're set up there, 
everyone always approaches me and they got this great idea that's going to make millions of dollars. You know? And I felt like we were just those guys with the great idea approaching other artists. So uh, I had to ask my friend, and he's like kind of like an up and coming writer. And uh, I, basically, I literally called him. Uh, he lives out in LA, and you know, I'm in New York. And I was like, dude, you, can you write something in like a couple of days? I'll draw it in like a week, can you, just so we can prove to people like that we have something. Yeah. And then uh, he actually came up with something that was pretty cool. And uh, well, <laughs> also, <laughs> so I did art in a week. Yeah. <laughs> Secret Identities, the Asian American Superhero Anthology, presents I used to spend a lot of time thinking about what to call myself and what my outfit should look like. I eventually realized my actions would be what defined me as a hero, not what I wore or called myself. I was proud when the others started to accept me as one of their own. Even though I was just a Nisei kid, flying by the seat of his pants. December 7th, 1941, changed everything. I wish I knew ahead of time what was gonna happen in Hawaii that day. That caught us all. Surprise. I can't help but wonder how different things would be had I been there to defend Pearl Harbor. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Things might not have ended up this way. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. A little over two months later, and I'm surrounded by the very same people I thought had accepted me. They tell me that if I don't surrender, they'll take me by force. I know I can't fight. I know I could take a beating, but I'm afraid what a fight will do to others that look like me. I thought that it didn't matter who we were when our masks were off. I thought I proved where my loyalties lie when I consistently put myself in harm's way. The truth is, it's not what you do that matters, but what you look like. I was a hero once. Now, I'm just another Jap. So that story, I mean, it's a short story and a fairly simple one, um, but it changed something in the way we were looking at the book. You know, we realized that, uh, first of all, it wasn't enough simply just to represent stories that featured Asian Americans. You know, that if we wanted to accomplish the goals we talked about, you know, of stories that were authentic and had an integrity and that really connected with our experience as Asian Americans, that couldn't be altered and inverted and converted into something else, you know, we had to reach farther back and farther in. Um, and as a result, you know, we, uh, we started uh, outreaching people and telling them about what 9066 was, this story that was set in World War II, um, and started getting stories that represented, if you will, kind of a shadow history of, of the United States. You know, we started uh, seeing through Asian American eyes. Um, we started getting stories, you know, uh, actually I, I did a story, uh, partnered with somebody to create a story that was set in the days of the Transcontinental Railroad a retelling of the John Henry myth uh, called Driving Steel, which actually uh, features John Henry as a young boy uh, who, with a, shall we say, unusual uh, Chinese man and, you know, as, as his sort of mentor and, uh, and kind of a father figure. Uh, and you know, similarly, other people also you know, submitted stories that were sort of pulled from history in the history textbooks and, and the headlines. Um, you know, Heroes Without a Country, uh, was a story that was about the sort of flip side of the Japanese internment, uh, the 442nd, uh, still the most decorated, um, you know, army unit in all military unit actually in, in all of uh, American history. Um, there were uh, Japanese Americans who chose to fight to prove their patriotism for the country, 
and subsequently were received more wounds and, and you know more medals than any other unit in the war. Um, you know, going through, going forward, looking at issues, looking at historical moments where we as Asian Americans were a critical part of the story and yet have been overlooked, and then retelling that story through the lens of, of the superhero. You know, that actually ended up being a, a big arc of the book. But that wasn't all, honestly. You know, we also looked at a lot of issues um, that uh, were, again, kind of integral to who we are as Asian Americans. There were a lot of stories about, you know, stereotypes, uh, about social expectations, about parental expectations. We had three separate stories about, you know, parents wanting their kids to grow up to be superheroes. <laughs> and, you know, the kids were like, I want to be a doctor. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, so people were, were finally speaking in a voice that was sort of substantial uh, and, and linked to what it meant to be Asian American. And so, you know, as we actually progress to this sort of next piece of this exercise, um, I'm going to do uh, one thing here. I'm going to show you uh, an example of some of the stuff that uh, other people have, have done as part of this. Um, these are actually pieces from um, a contest we ran with uh, the uh, blogger Angry Asian Man, which hopefully all of you guys are you know, frequent readers of. Um, but uh, it, was, it was our version of the Build a Hero contest um, through his site. And um, we chose four winners. Um, each of them, we felt, you know, kind of showed how you could tell a superhero story from an Asian American, an authentically Asian American lens, or, and an Asian American story from an authentically superhero book. Um, <clears throat> up uh, on the left, uh, upper left there, we had a, a hero called The Sneak. And The Sneak is a uh, Chinese American b-boy who actually comes into his powers because he acquires a set of uh, mystical you know, mystical sneakers <laughs> uh, that give him, you know, incredible abilities. It's a really cool t-shirt. A lot yes. of rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's Hush. Hush is uh, a uh, bisexual Korean adoptee, translation adopted yeah. Korean, who um, has, uh, you know, despite having kind of retreated into a shell uh, after being, you know, abandoned most of her life, uh, acquires the power to empathize with others. Uh, and to almost telepathically be able to predict what they're going to do next and manipulate their behavior, um, all without speaking. Uh, Tumbas, on the, the bottom there, um, Tumbas is the uh, Filipino, the Tagalog word for equal. And uh, Tumbas is actually, you know, kind of two characters, because, uh, you know, it's, it's actually about a pair of twin brothers who are also nemeses. You know, one has essentially the power of invincibility, and the other has the power of, you know, of indestructibility. So, it's really an exercise in sort of talking about uh, how two characters, equal and opposite, you know, might kind of come up against each other, uh, despite the, the bond of their blood. And then finally, we have Wildstyle here, uh, a Thai American um, graffiti artist who ends up uh, getting on the wrong side of a demon queen, and uh, subsequently being forced to combat the sort of hordes of demons that 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 uh, that evil being releases through a power of her own. She, she uh, gains the power to ta tattoo um, images and characters on people and transform them into mystical beasts and you know, use them to actually combat these dark forces. You know, so all these came out of you know, interesting stories that were authentic to the people who were writing them. You know, by and large, people were writing about their own experiences and then talking about what came next after the secret origin that essentially transformed them. Uh, so in this exercise, we want you guys to kind of do the same. We're going to start from scratch. We're going to ask you to start building a, a story with us. And as editors and as uh, an art director, what we want to do is we want to guide that, that character into something that, that really does sort of present an original uh, Asian American superhero that's, we hope, kind of authentic to, to our experiences. Um, so so uh, if you wanted to start thinking about what you know, a superhero is, you know, first of all, you have to think about visually describing what that person, especially for someone like Jared. We, if we go on and on about this person's story, Jared's gonna sit back and be like, uh, what do you want me to draw? <laughs> so if we were to think about the type of superhero you would create, you know, basic things like, is it a male or female? Well, let's start with that. So would this superhero be a male or female? You can sh anyone can shout out. Female. female. All right. <laughs> female superhero. All right. So a female superhero. Young, old. What? What age? What? Uh, let's describe it. College age. High school. High school. High school age. Okay. 
So high school age. You just got an email. I did. <laughs> yeah, so we have a high school. So like, <laughs> like a hit. Ding. 16, 17 years old, maybe younger, older. 16 years. So we have a 16 year old female. Now, 16 year old female. Uh, is she? What does she look like? Is she gawky? Just sort of coming into her, you know, her height and her features. Uh, you know, is she tall? She's short. Is she athletic? Anyone? Tall and athletic. Tall and athletic. All right. Tall and athletic, but has braces. But <laughs> okay. Uh, tall, athletic, with braces. And what, what ethnicity is she? I mean, can, tell us a little bit about her, her background and her, her, her family and her history. Oftentimes, like, uh, where the hero comes from can really uh, inform yeah, and Yeah, really uh, just explain who they are. Like, Batman would not come from, like, a small town. The suburbs. You know? Yeah, he wouldn't be from the suburbs. And Iron Man would not come from yeah. Um, so yeah, tell us, throw out some, some ideas. Russia. I'm sorry? Russia. Russia is interesting, actually, because uh, there is actually a large group of, of Mongolians and Siberians who, who look Asian, who are Asians, actually, but who are, who are in Russia. So, uh, but somebody else said something else? Oh, I said mixed. Mixed. So maybe she's mixed, Russian, Russian and half something. Russian. Half Russian, half Siberian, something. All right. Uh, so <laughs> Half Vietnamese? Oh, we can do that. Vietnam and Russia? Half, half Vietnamese, half Russian. Well, that's interesting because uh, Vietnam and Russia, maybe a child of the Cold War, kind of, right? You know, post Vietnam. Um, okay, so she came when she was six, um, and she's now 16, so 10 years have passed. So uh, I also think if she's from Russia and Vietnam, that might affect her powers as well. Right? Yeah, you know, one of the things we actually uh, often say is when we get to the point of talking about powers, think about this from the perspective of where the powers come from. Very often, you know, there's a, a base in like legend or folklore or personal experience. You know, when, when something happens to you and changes you physically, it, it grants you a power, right? So think of the historical, you know, her personal history and how that might shape what her powers end up being. Um, but okay, so we, does she have a family? She's alone? Yes, she has family. I'm sorry? She has family. She has family. What kind of family? Parents? A lot of <laughs> big family. Grand, she grew up with a big family? But her grandparents are still there. Her grandparents still, are still there. Still where? Russia. Still in Russia. In Russia? Oh, one side of grandparents, I guess, are still in Russia. <laughs> All right, um, so, so we know that she, uh, does she have, okay, let's get some more physical features so Jerry can start working on this. Long hair, short hair. Long hair. Short hair. Dark hair. Long, she has short, long hair. Long, long on one side and short on the other. She's got a mullet. <laughs> She's got an Asian mullet. Oh boy, let's not do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so she had long hair or short hair? I give her long bangs with short hair. Long bangs with short hair. All right. <laughs> short bangs with long hair. All right. Well, let's do the long bangs. It's not, you know, not bad. I have a sort of, you know. Okay. So long bangs, short hair. Any other distinguishing features? Um, her hair is dark. Her hair is dark. Okay. Uh, what about what about things that you might point out? Like if you're doing a police, police description, does she have any marks? Any freckles? Any freckles. Freckles. That's interesting. Uh, she, well, she's half Russian, right? Um, so, okay, she's half Russian. Russian. She, I don't know. <laughs> well, they have pale skins, I guess. Um, so, okay, uh, what else? Any scars? Any any marks? Any tattoos? Any piercings? She's what kind of piercings? 16, though. We have to remember. Yeah, they can have piercings. She, 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 she has piercings on her braces. Right? <laughs> um, glasses. glasses? Okay, glasses and braces. And freckles. Man, what are we doing with this? <laughs> All right. Not there's anything wrong with that. I got, I got the specs, right? Um, okay, let's talk about powers. So, okay, l again, let's talk, about, let's talk about her history. She's a child of the Cold War. She has a large family, and she has family that's still abroad in, in Vietnam and in Russia. Maybe that ties into her story somehow. Um, because she, and she's biracial, so she draws from a tradition that's Russian on the one hand and, and Vietnamese on the other. And how do those things combine? You know, what could have, what what powers could she have that, that sort of ties into that background? I'm sorry. Multilingual. She can be multilingual. She has a code there, like code words, everything she looks at, like reading. Ah, so she, maybe she's the ultimate cold word. Yeah, well, it's yeah. well, the, the other interesting thing about you know Russia and Vietnam though is that the climates of both countries are, are so different. different. Yeah. You have a cold climate in Viet in, in Russia, but you have this tropical, you know, humid climate well, in Vietnam. So maybe there's a turtleneck. That makes zero sense. <laughs> <laughs> As a fashion designer, you would know more than I about that. Well, well but, but there may be something in that dichotomy of, of both her cultures being from such different like climates. If, if we're giving her a cold stare, maybe she also has... Maybe she's hot. 
too. <laughs> hot, um, she's got hot but breath. you know, there's something to that. I mean, the the you know the it's idea like the that opposite of Superman. Superman's got cold that, breath uh, and heat vision, and she's got heat breath and cold vision. <laughs> well, <laughs> Okay, so let's let's take this other ways too. I mean, one of the back in the era of the Soviet Union, you know, one of the things that people talked out a lot about was containment, right? Was about this notion that if the reason why we're fighting in Vietnam was because, you know, if one domino fell, the whole world would become communist, right? It's this notion of falling dominoes. If you, you know, if one thing, uh, if you, if if one falls, then again, the sort of like cascading effect occurs. Um, I mean, I like the idea of somehow having her powers linked to the Cold War because. Among other things, a lot of origins come out of things like military technology or experimentation that may have occurred on one parent or both, you know, or maybe that's kind of what has happened is both her, of her, her parents have like, you know, kind of secret super soldier experiments that have gone on uh, unknown to them. You know, they were born into programs, you know, where they were experimented with, and yet nothing happened until they got married and had a kid, and this kid ended up with the kind of powers from both strains somehow. So would this be like a period piece, do you think? I mean, so if, if the Cold War is so influential. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it won't be a period piece. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe the, so, the, because the parents are products of the Cold War, maybe, you know, when she's born many years later after the Cold War. When sleeveless turtlenecks when, when sleeveless were, turtleneck <laughs> were, 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 were popular. Well, when I meant period piece, I meant like maybe in the 80s. Because, you know, if, if we're, if we're if, if, like I said, if the Cold War is such an influential part of the story, it would make sense then to have it take place during the Cold War, no? Yeah, I mean, although um, one of the things that we've actually done in the book is we, we suggested that there are forces out there that are trying to kind of recapture some of the, the alliances and some of the, um, you know, the, the uh, sorry about that, <laughs> some of the um, uh, antipathies that existed back when. There's actually uh, a character in the book who's sort of like this looming dark figure in the background called Mishira, which means, you know, in Japanese, stranger, right? And he actually, it turns out, is um, an agent of uh, a Japanese, a new Japanese imperium, you know? Uh, a force that wants to, a military force that wants to kind of put the emperor back into absolute control of Japan. So there, is, there are ways that we could have a Cold War force. I mean, when you think about it, Russia these days is starting to look a little bit more like the Soviet Union back then than we kind of expected. Um, so perhaps there is a, a force of XKGB agents or something that's trying to... Well, then, is it possible she had other powers as well? That, that it's not just this one power? Why don't you tell us? Was she like a spy or something? Or? I don't think she's a spy, but I think, you know, they are going to try to recruit her because uh, these, these powers that came from another generation are manifesting in her. And all of a sudden, this, you know, this sort of gawky adolescent girl with glasses and braces and, <laughs> you know, not knowing anything is all of a sudden being stalked by men in black. So, so tell us, other, maybe there's something else that, that she has. This cold stare, I mean, we're not even sure what that does right now, right? Well, she's, you said if you, she, she looks at someone and yeah, they like freeze? Yeah, like maybe when she gets angry, then it'll just freeze. So whenever she looks at someone with anger, happens. So when she looks at somebody and goes like that? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, they're <laughs> up. That's so cool. they, they literally freeze like ice or like they, 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 oh, okay. All right, so, so do we have any, anything else? It's like Frozone's powers, but from her eyes. <laughs> Uh, any other, another power maybe? Something that might, uh, that might link into that, or, or? She'd be able to like, like, people from the past, she should be, they should be able to talk to her. Like, so all the people that happened in like the Cold War, she can like hear their thoughts and then use that to help her in the future, in the dream piece itself kind of thing. You know, well it's interesting, because um, one of the things I think about, you know, when I think about the whole notion of sort of dominoes tumbling, you know, is, is this notion of, of generations, you know, and what happens from generation to generation. You know, they always say like the sins of the parent are vested on the children and the grandchildren onto the, you know, the 30th generation or whatever. You know, so maybe there's something in that. Maybe, you know, one of the things that's, maybe one of the interesting things about her might be that they've actually, her, her lineage going back on both sides is actually full of, of individuals who are, have been part of, of attempts to create somebody extraordinary. And they've never succeeded, you know? I don't know if any of you guys have read Dude, maybe she's a croissant <laughs> uh, But We're not geeks here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. had, she, uh, she had her hand. Yeah. Um, what if like, they, the, um, the military powers had her parents like, come together like for eugenics because they wanted this to create it and they didn't really love each other. And then so she started hating like, these two, like this combination of things mm -hmm. in her. And so like, she could be like, a metaphor for like, a father-son sort of like, connection. I think that's really interesting. 
because the notion of a eugenics program kind of links into this notion of kind of generations. You know, so, so her parents were brought together. They were an arranged marriage, basically. <laughs> um, but arranged by the government uh, <laughs> to, to create this sort of super being. And, uh, and maybe her grandparents as well, and, and you know, multiple generations back, have all been kind of part of this program. Nothing's happened, nothing's successful until she comes along, and here she is in America, and all of a sudden these things start manifesting. So what else do we, what else do, do we know about? Okay, yes. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, we're deciding that. Well, I mean, it, it, those two things kind of work together well. I mean, you know, but maybe those maybe she has both powers. You know, maybe she can, you know. Maybe she leaves an icy residue. <laughs> um, like you know, time has been frozen because you you look around and all of a sudden you have like ice on your arm. I'm sorry. The people that she inherits can tell her to go back in time, and then when she goes back in time, she can fix that knowledge. I, you know, I think as far as manifesting the power, I mean, I, th I think that, um, you know, why don't we actually look at it this way? Maybe what happened is that all the different powers of all the, the whole program, right? So it's not just one power she has. The cold stare is the first thing that she's actually learned that she, she has the ability for. But all the, the whole eugenics program has been designed to create extraordinary beings. But instead of creating a thousand you know, extraordinary people across all these generations, they've created one with like a thousand powers. But she's only, she has discovered them one by one. And what happens is, as she reaches back, you know, like different generations uh, who should have inherited a certain power, you know, are speaking to her, saying, you know, giving her clues as to as to the next thing that she should be able to do. You know, it may even be possible that the the various experiments throughout the years were all failures, but all of a sudden, this this girl was born here in America, right? And and she's she's starting exhibiting all these powers that some retired KGB agent should have had. Well, and, and he, he and he finds out about her, and then that he's after her. So she's like a one-person X-Files, right? All these sort of paranormal abilities that should have, that this breeding program was supposed to create never worked until this one person you know, ended up with these things. And the, the whole notion of a domino theory, like each power she finds could lead her to another dead ghost in her past, and uh, this, an, an this ancestor. This kind of ties into maybe her age, too. Like if she's coming, well, 16 is maybe too old, but like coming into like, you know, it's kind of like the equivalent of puberty, that she's all of a sudden learning to deal with all these changes to her. You know, and, and so maybe we make her look, well, we can't make her look good. But, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that, that's, that, that, kind, that kind of also, you know, ties into to the, to, to the gawkiness of her, of her age and, and what you go through as a teenager. I mean, one thing but, to think but, about. But, but, but amplifies with, with superpowers. I think we have a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, I was wondering about her mental health. Well, you that's know. It's like a lot to deal with. It is a lot to deal with. Hey, your body changes, but it doesn't change that much, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, you're starting to get thousands of powers one by one. I mean, obviously, in her, and plus she's talking to dead people, like her dead ancestors are in her head. So she's probably a little bit messed up, and, and that's one of the things she's trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to fix this thing that's going on inside of her. Um, maybe, like, once she gets a new power, she loses her old power. That's why it's sort of a domino thing, right? So, you know, what happens is each power is a clue to the next. It sort of connects her to another ancestor who then shares kind of hints as to what that next power is. Once she discovers it, she uses it in some fashion. But you know, once she discovers the next one, the previous one disappears. That's a that's kind of a cool idea. A very cool idea. It could be like a new age, like sixteen candles and she could get all this stuff on her sixteenth birthday so that the next day is her life because she doesn't know what's going on. And I think that she should have a fur hat. <laughs> What's her name? Let's give her like some Anya. more identification. Anya. Anya's her, Anya's her, her, her real person name, right? Um, let's, let, do we have a code name as well? I mean, I, I like, I kind of like the, even though Domino is a taken name, you know? Um, but, you know, something like, uh, the, the program might have been called Product Domino. I mean, Domino, the other thing about Dominoes is that there are analogs of Dominoes in virtually every culture, like in Asia, in, in the East, in Latin America, and so forth. You know, so this, this notion of uh, using a metaphor of a domino is something that actually is transcultural. And it would make sense that, you know, it might be something seen in, in Russia and in Vietnam at the same time. Um, but, okay, uh, other, other thoughts around that? What, what about her surname? Is her surname Russian or is, is it Vietnamese? Uh, well, if her first name is Anya, then her last name should be Vietnamese. Vietnamese, that's what I'm thinking. 
What's a good last What's word? a good Vietnamese last word? Win. Win? <laughs> yeah, because there aren't enough wins. Anya win. Anya win. win. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Anya win. Um, so, okay. Um, let, now let's talk about her story. It's like already we've set up the fact that she's got a journey, and that journey is leading her somewhere. She's going back in time, you know, kind of meeting in her head these ancestors who are, are guiding her down this sort of domino path of discovering these powers. But is it taking her somewhere? What's what is she trying to accomplish? You know, what's what's ultimately you know the the goal of her life at this point? trying to find, she's trying to lead her way back. Maybe in fact, what's what's happening is the first power she gets is actually the earliest one. It's like 16 generations back. And so she's trying to track her way all the way back down to her, essentially. Yeah. You know, and, and part of it may be that what uh, what happened is, you know, the 16, 16 candles thing, you know, maybe part of the reason it was the worst day of her life is, is because, you know, not only is she overlooked, you know, and uh, and her, her birthday is, is kind of forgotten, but maybe it's because of, uh, of, of you know, there's a good reason for it. Maybe like her parents have disappeared, you know? Um, and it's actually, you know, because these people realize that she is finally the culmination of this experiment that's been running for 16 generations, you know, they've actually kidnapped her parents because she was away somewhere sulking. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to use them as leverage. So she's, in, she's looking for them, and she's doing it by sort of going back in time from her 16th generation ancestor down through the generations, each each one passing on a new power and each one losing the last, hopefully getting to the point where she actually can communicate and connect with her parents. You know, because since each of these ancestors are in her head, you know, eventually she's gonna get down to to her living ancestors and, and that might lead her to where her parents are and ultimately to herself. Um, that's not a bad story right there. Well, how about this? Um, instead of actually having it, because it's a, a eugenics program that we talked about, instead of it being a secret brother, how about if uh, there's a, a counterpart, a secret counterpart, who instead of having a Vietnamese father and a Russian mother, has is the other side of the reading pool, so to speak, right? Because they've been kind of connecting all these different, uh, um, you know, families that they hope to turn extraordinary. And one ended up with Anya, and the other ended up with. This other guy. Did he go to the same high school? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, despite the fact that they should actually get along. I mean, they do. But, the, <laughs> but are the powers? Do, do they? Does the other guy have the powers too, or is she still like the unique one? With, with, because if you give her a counterpart, then you take away her uniqueness of being the only one of all these failed experiments who all of a sudden has these latent abilities she doesn't know about. So. I, I think. I mean, what it could be is that he's like the inverse. Right? So instead of being somebody who has one power at a time, maybe he has lots and lots of powers all at once or something, or something along those lines, where it's like he's truly the complement to her in some fashion. Is this her younger brother? No, this is like, this is like a, separate. a separate product of the same reading program. Who I've seen in the same high school. <laughs> They're like cousins, basically. Uh, other, any other uh, thoughts? Do you have your hand up? or? I was going to say maybe he seems normal, but then as he's maybe trying to find her, he ends up with some certain powers. Or, or maybe they're not quite superpowers, but something. Well, he may not have powers, but maybe he hears the same voices. Is oh, you know what? Maybe, he, maybe he's, he's going. Also? Yeah, but the other way. His well, maybe he's, he's going the other direction. She's tracking downwards from the 16th generation back to herself. And maybe he actually starts with a power. And then, you know, as, as, she, as she passes powers on, he kind of acquires them, you know? So it's sort of like, you know, he's, he's sort of a step behind and moving in the other direction, right? You know, but ultimately, um, you know, this, this idea that there's another, another person that this breeding program has produced and could end up either being a nemesis or a partner is sort of interesting. I think that's an excellent cliffhanger for the, the issue, you know? <laughs> it's, like romantic it's, entanglement. it's like It's like yeah. Yoda saying there is another, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. What if he doesn't have any powers, but he knows all about the experiment, so like, maybe he could end up helping her, like, learn about her powers, even though he doesn't See, that's why I'm thinking maybe he's powerless, but he still can hear the same voices she hears. 
like an echo of the voice and of the shell. And they're all telling me he's a dud. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't he be more like Anya? But, but he, hear, he hears these voices and he hears this name Anya. So this other guy, you know, he, he, he's, he's also got the mental problems because he's like, why am I hearing these voices? Who is Anya? And he, his whole journey is finding Anya and, and, and figuring out why he's hearing these voices. And that's when we learn that he's also connected somehow to this, to Project Domino. He's, he's the dud. He's Project the echo he's, of, yeah. that's, that's his name. Echo. His name's echo. Echo's, that's cool. Very nice. Um, very nice. <laughs> I try. Um, and maybe his name could be Ed Cow or something like that. There you uh, go. Ed Cow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so okay, so I mean, I think we got most of the storyline back here, and you know, why don't we just uh, give Jerry some time to actually uh, to, to draw some stuff and, and open yeah. up the floor for some questions. Yeah. Any any questions you have about the book, our mission? If you want to keep talking about Echo and Domino, <laughs> that's fine too. Anyone? Yeah. I was gonna ask. Um, this is kind of a general question, but like, if if people let's say are not Asian American, like let's say they're Caucasian or African American or Latino, and they're sort of trying to either write something or they're a filmmaker. If you would have any recommendations of, you know, if they want to include Asian American characters, but in a way that's not a caricature. Well, you know, actually, I, I was just at Towson University a couple of weeks ago doing this presentation. I think you guys play Towson, aren't you guys in the CAA? We, did, I think Northeastern just recently. Oh, I thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to open. I didn't mean to pry open a wound. But anyway, I was I was speaking at Towson. It's, just, it's rare to go to visit other CAA schools. I I graduated from Old Dominion, so you know, oh, so Colonial yeah. Athletic Association. What's that? My goes there. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, v, 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 you in the house. VA represent. Um, so I, I had the exact same question. Someone said that they actually they're a writer. They 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 write fiction, and she she was Caucasian. She said, how do I incorporate? you know, ethnic characters or Asian American characters without being stereotypes. And, and the only ad advice I would give you as a writer is that just make them real people. And that's all, that's all anyone asks for. I mean, because the thing about stereotypes, I mean, just, just from just a literary perspective, I mean, stereotypes are kind of necessary in fiction because, you know, not every character in a book can be fleshed out, right? Because then the novels would be like 3,000 pages. So there is, a, there is a reason why there are cliches and stereotypes in, in just in literature in general. But you know, if you wanted to include a character that was not st a stereotype or was not a cliche, then, then all I would say was make sure that that character is a real person. Could, could this person exist in real life? You know, the, the funny thing is that even Asian American writers often kind of uh, start <laughs> believing their own hype to a certain extent. I mean, you know, there's a tendency to actually t you know, write Asian American stories or Asian American characters, especially those that are period, kind of set back in, you know, the, the dawn of, uh, uh, of the, you know, Ming Dynasty or you know the uh, period of immigration of the states, where all of the the humanity of the characters is sort of like uh, overwritten with um, tragedy and melodrama, and you know it's like, you know, you're always abandoning kids or. or <laughs> being beaten by your husband, or you know, losing your your you know long lost love, and you know, you end up being kind of like a collection of metaphors and not like a real human being. And you know, I think that um, it's funny because we were talking about this in a very different light in the car um, about how you know you can do all the research in the world, but un until enough you can get really inside the skin of somebody, you know, that research, even being able to tell true history, doesn't necessarily come together as a real character. And the example we're actually using was not anything Asian American at all. There's a, there's a, a television program on TV, uh, TV. <laughs> a television program called um, The Big Bang Theory, um, which some of you guys may watch, and it's actually about you know these two geeks. So we were really kind of like you know empathizing, and, uh, and you know Keith actually made the comment that uh, it's interesting. These guys are both comic book geeks, among other kinds of geek geekdom, and um, they talk about comics. The way that a comic book, well, sorry, they talk about comic book stuff as if they know what they're talking about. Like, well, I, I, basically, I I just recently come to the show. I, I hadn't watched it when it was on, and a friend of mine lent me the DVD, so I watched them, and they're like, oh, this is really good. And, and uh, who's familiar with the Big Bang Theory? Anyone? Well, um, so if you're familiar, you know it's about it's about these four friends. They're all physicists at uh, Cal State, and they're also like comic book nerds. And and my friend who 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 lent me the DVDs himself is actually a scientist. 
And um, when, after I watched the shows and then we started talking and he was like, so what did you think of the Big Bang Theory? I was like, well, you know, because he knows I'm into comics and stuff. He's like, so what did you think? I was like, well, you know, it's funny. It's like I could tell that the screenwriters of the, the, the showrunners like looked up comic they books. And stuff. A bunch of comics. Yeah, because they, I mean, the stuff they talked about was real stuff. They were actually talking about what was going on in comics at the time and, and they weren't making up names. You know, they were actually talking about like Star Trek and speaking, when they were speaking Klingon, they were really speaking Klingon, not that I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it came off inauthentic. It came off as if someone just Googled all this stuff and put it in the script. They didn't seem like real like comic book nerds to me. I don't know. And, but, the, but the flip of that is that my friend the scientist, apparently all the science on the show is actually real too. They have like, you know, a, a consultant who's making sure that all the equations on the board are actually you know, correct and everything. They're not just making up stuff. Not like, like, not like Star Trek where they're just like techno babble, where they're actually, the, the science they talk about is actual real science. My scientist friend said, that's interesting, because I like the comic book stuff, but I thought the science stuff on the show is like someone just research all the science, but the scientists don't really talk like that. So it's like, he appreciated like the comic book nerd aspect of it and thought the science stuff was inauthentic. I was like, wow, that science stuff is really impressive, but the comic book stuff I could do without. Yeah. So it's, 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 so the whole, you know, this is a long-winded way to get back to your question, is that, you know, ultimately, you know, you can do all the research and, and, and give everyone every possible personality or whatever, but it all boils down to, is this character real or not? A you real know, human being. Actually, I think the exercise we just did here you know, shows how we try to approach it as editors. You know? we, we didn't want to just tell a story about somebody who's a collection of powers. We wanted to get inside their head. You know, and in, in fact, actually understand stuff about that, that character that might not even show up in the story. You know, what are the motivations? What's driving this person? Where are they going? You know, where do they come from? These are just as important for Asian American characters as you know for any other character, right? And um, I think that you sometimes lose that in, in the process of, uh, of, of telling an Asian American story. Um, and I think speaking of that character, Jerry. Do you want to share this thing? Yeah, sure. I'm just throwing without the furry hat on. <laughs> <laughs> we had the furry hat on. All right. So this is a. Uh, this is Jerry's rendition of uh, Domino, and I, I see we have is that here Echo, Echo down here yeah. on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Um, she, she's doing her cold stare thing, I guess. What am I hearing? Her eyes are bleeding. I don't know how many other colors to go. <laughs> um, but it's, it's gorgeous. And, and the, uh, the, the background here, you can kind of see the, um, you know, sort of like these images the of the ghosts and the voices in her head. So, And this is this her in a fur hat. <laughs> Which I based off your hat. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, big hand for Jerry here. <laughs> um, so, uh, we're actually, I mean, we're going to stick around. Yeah, we'll stick around here. We're actually going to wrap up this part of it. We're, we have books, obviously, to sell, and you know, we'll be signing, and, and we'd certainly love for you guys to actually uh, approach us, buy books, <laughs> get them signed, and so forth. And, uh, and, and you can come take a tips. closer look at Echo the Domino. Yes. yes. We'll, we'll, we'll deliver, I, I guess whoever made the first suggestion. So, uh, yeah, folks here, and then we'll sit here and, and sign.